Welcome to Calibrate Conversations, a podcast about embracing God's standard for sexuality. I'm your host, Brady Cohn, and joining me today is my friend, Shannon. What's up, Brady? How are you doing today, Shannon? I'm great. Dude, it's been forever since I've seen you. I know. So we went to college together, and we haven't seen each other since. So it's been like over 10 years ago. Definitely maybe over longer. 10 years. So I, when were you at Shadron? Uh, well, I went to Shadron State uh, between 2011 and 2000... I mean, sorry, 2007 to 2011. Yeah. And so you were a lo- younger than me, but I remember you mm-hmm. involved in college ministry. And then when I was on staff with crew, you were, I, w- I was around the college some. And so that's been, uh, it's still been over 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I actually, so I went to college there for a theater degree. And uh, one of the things my parents told me to do right as I got plugged in, because it was a state college, they're like, you need to get plugged into a church. And I was like, sure, because I grew up in church my whole life. Uh, so I went to Shattered Community Church, and then I think I found Campus Crusade first, and I ran into you, and then someone bumped into me from Shattered Community Church about Chi Alpha, uh, and they were looking for someone to lead worship, and I was just teaching myself guitar, so I got plugged into that. So college ministry and church was pretty pretty good right off the bat from awesome. college, yeah. Awesome. So we recently reconnected, and I was really blown away to hear some of your story, mm-hmm. and it's so... Uh, to me, what, what's so mind-blowing sometimes is to hear what was going on behind the scenes of someone's life that, you know, you cross paths with during a season of life, but mm-hmm. you don't understand all the things that influence them. You don't understand the things that they're struggling with. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really cool to see God provide you with so much redemption and grace uh, and also heartbreaking to hear some of what you had gone through that I had no idea. Mm. So today we're going to hear your story yeah. and we'll, I think, and it will see some of the kind of common lies that our culture believes about sexuality and, uh, and how we can embrace God's standard. Like, like you have. Awesome. Thanks Brady. So yeah, from the get go, I grew up in a Christian home my whole life. I grew up in a small town, about 6,000 people, Western Nebraska, uh, I had a pretty ideal childhood. I can't complain. And uh, I made friends right off the bat and got plugged into a small church. And I had two older brothers, mom and dad. And so everything seemed fantastic. I, like, I love my childhood. Um, but as I was growing up, uh, everything looked great and fine on the surface. You know, I was going to Awana's and then as I got older, went to youth group and I was plugged into my church. I got involved in worship there and all that. But, uh, the thing is from when I was younger, even before puberty, there was already stuff setting into my life that like, I didn't even realize was starting to manipulate the way that I was thinking and it started really changing me from the inside out. And when we moved to Sydney, Nebraska, when I was in the first grade and uh, I was, you know, if anybody can relate to, you know, moving uh, when you're at a really young age, it's always just trying to figure out how to fit in. And so when I got into that first grade classroom, uh, they said, okay, take a seat anywhere. And there was one kid that just shot his hand up. He's like, you can sit next to me. And that just made me feel so welcome. And from then on, like that guy and I have been like so close. Uh, in fact, he was my best man at my wedding in 2012. Uh, so good guy. And um, <clears throat> the thing is when you're in a small town and growing up, cause we would hang out a lot. Uh, we would ride bikes to each other's houses. Uh, and a lot of times we would just hang out on the weekends. Sometimes we'd have sleepovers with a bunch of friends, whatever, playing games all night. Uh, but there was a few times starting off cause this guy, my best friend, I'll call him. Um, he instilled in me actually a lot of my foundational faith where I'm at. Uh, he's very wise, very well versed in scripture, even at like such a young age. Cause he also went to church in a Christian home and all that. Uh, he was just so wise and I was just in awe of like how brilliant this guy was. Uh, and so he would just like teach me a lot. And, um, the thing though, is that on some weekend nights, uh, we, there, there'd be a sleepover and um he'd go into these rants talking about some stuff about history because he was a big history buff and i love history and uh some of the things he would talk about was kind of these weird practices that different historical cultures would do i don't know so i was intrigued and basically one thing led to another even as just young boys like uh 
he asked me if I could show him, you know, my private parts and stuff and then the same. And so it just kind of came to this like, weird experimental prepubescent phase between these boys. And um, the thing is, is like that would recur over, you know, throughout the years, even up till, you know, like junior high. And um, it each time it just like escalated. And at the time, I didn't even realize like it was wrong. I was just uh, a young kid and I was in this exploration mode and not realizing that I was, you know, at this moment playing with fire and thinking that this is all right. And um, the sad truth is that as that happened, I also, as my friend group expanded uh, to junior high and even to high school, like there was at least seven to eight other guys all in secrecy on their own, not knowing of each other that we basically got into sexual interaction uh, with each other. And um, yeah, as I grew older, got to keep going to church and Awanas and all that stuff, slowly that guilt and shame started to seep in. And what the really interesting thing is that, because this was all with other boys, I wasn't attracted to them. Uh, There's nothing in them like I, I've, and even to this day, I've never had any attraction to males or whatnot, but it was this seeking of this physical gratification physical pleasure Absolutely. and it was just right there for me and they were wanting it too sometimes you take what's what's easiest and yeah. it's right there and and this is like small town nebraska mm -hmm. and this you know this was what 15 years ago at least 20 years ago uh, yeah yeah and uh and so i think a lot of people don't understand that so much of this can happen in kind of social circles and under the radar and and we think of sometimes uh, think of it as just innocent experimentation, yeah. but it's really not. It, it, you know, it causes a lot of confusion. And I've known guys who've really, really been messed up by that type of experimentation. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it didn't, the thing is that it didn't stop there, of course, because as I got into puberty and growing, I've got more curious and I had another group of friends where, you know, of course they found dad's hidden porn stash or whatever. And so then we got into those via magazines or old VHS tapes. And so, and those were with different friends, not the ones that I was experimenting with sexually. And, uh, all the while through that too, I even remember there was a, even a few nights where there were sleepovers at like my house, uh, and, There'd be times like my dad would even, you know, come down the stairs and, you know, he'd just be checking on us, making sure everything's okay. And there's even one night in one of the weeks where he'd be like, hey, just want to check. Are you are you guys like behaving, doing this stuff? And I was like, oh, yeah. And so I was, no, I'm, I was lying to my dad that I was, you know, everything was all hunky dory. But um, so, yeah, I just kept feeling dirty uh, as that kept happening. And then, of course, with the whole uh, pornography, I just got super interested in that and of course being attracted to women and so i was into that but at the same time i was just going into this easy access sexual gratification with these other friends of mine um and then after that i went off to college um because this went up all the way to like my junior year of high school uh and until i started dating some other girls and then i went off to college and then uh after my freshman year of college i met jama who's now my wife um and about a year into our dating there, uh, we started getting a little handsy, started playing with fire. We never had you no know, intercourse, but still sex is sex. And mm -hmm. uh, so that even more so I was not proud of because here I am as a college independent student and I'm working now in college ministry. And now we're getting a little bit too close and all this. And I'm constantly hearing, and especially in the time that we were in, uh, purity culture was like the yeah. big thing. Absolutely. And so the main thing on my mind is, well, as soon as like I started, you know, getting a little too close to her physically, I was like, well, now I got to marry her because, you know, now we're one flesh, all this stuff. And so I was just hearing from all these different voices. And so every time I thought of our relationship, it, I guess it wasn't altogether joyous. It was like, well, now I have to do this because we just got really close to each other. Um, and then all the while behind all this, I had a porn addiction. Um, and uh, it's, the thing is, it all just stems from this constant, like, I, it is what it is, this addiction, this thing. It's like this drug, this chemical imbalance that from the beginning I have just been starting to feed. I know mm -hmm. it's not like you just wake up one day and you're like, I want to be a sex addict. I yeah, want to. Absolutely. It with starts that. with little thoughts. And yeah. Then it's some experimentation and it just starts to escalate and starts mm -hmm. to, you know, your brain starts to produce these chemicals and, 
uh, this euphoria feeling and that can be your mental escape and it just escalates and no one wakes up one day and says, oh, I want to be addicted to such and such. Yeah. But it's a slow process over time mm -hmm. that begins sometimes much younger than people realize. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, as much as I wish I could say that some of these older relationships like we've reconciled, we haven't so much. In fact, my my best friend, my best man on the night that the night before I got married, because he knew our past, obviously, because we were, you know, really close and had those moments in the past. Uh, he came out to me. He was saying, "Is like, I'm gay. And actually, I'm refuting my faith. Not only did he, you know, come out of the closet, but he was starting to uh, disapprove God and his mm. faith and all that. And that is the part that blew me away the most. But he, he went to college. He started to, I don't know if he just had that moment to really think or what all he experimented with or what went down. And the thing is, is that I still could not like argue with him or debate with him to this day. Cause he's such a sound mind guy. He's yeah. very smart, but we do still like respect each other. We understand, you know, what happened to us in our past. Granted his definition of how it all came about and what it all means is different than where I come from, where mine is just comes from this. Hey, I was, there's manipulation in these things that I was just going with what my body was craving. And, all this. Um, but anyway, we still connect every now and then, uh, but not in a, not in that way, not in yeah, like a sexual way absolutely. or anything. Um, but yeah, so I've been married now to Jema uh, since 2013. So over 11 years and ever since we've been married, ever since we started dating, I have not had a sexual interaction with any other guys or any other women or any of that. But all the while, the thing that's still been rearing its ugly head was this porn addiction. That was still the thing that was there. This, the temptation has never left is a thing. Um, and so what I have discovered throughout all of it, I've tried, you know, the different books, there's the different, uh, software, the different video programs, or you could do the study guides or, uh, little retreats or whatever to try, you know, kick this just like it's like, it's another, uh, addiction problem. Um, but I, all the time when I tried to pursue getting rid of that, a, a lot of it was just out of my own effort, my own will. Mm -hmm. I did it in isolation. I didn't want to let people know. Nobody on my church staff knew. My wife didn't even know uh, until just a couple of years ago when I just told her I came out about it because we were having some issues just with intimacy between the two of us. And so I came out blatantly. And yeah, it was it was rough. It was, it was a train wreck. Absolutely. Um, but throughout the years, praise God, she has been so gracious to me and patient with me. Uh, and one of the biggest blessings in my life is actually me connecting with a group of other guys who are also, one of them is on staff, uh, at, at the church that I serve at in Omaha, Nebraska, and another guy is on staff at another church. So they're both church guys on staff, but <laughs> turns out they also struggle with sexual addiction problems. It's like, it's, we all treat it like it's this taboo thing. Like hardly anybody struggles with it, but if everybody was like honest with it and came out truthfully <laughs> with it, like the... We wouldn't have enough chairs in these rooms for SA groups. Or, Absolutely. No, yeah. and so many times guys go so long dealing with it in secret, and then they get so frustrated and bitter and angry at God and, and think that, uh, well, you know, God owed me something. God should have taken this away, and I did all the things I was supposed to do, yeah. and it, it didn't work. And I see that a lot with sometimes with same sex attraction. So they end up just coming out of the closet as gay and this is who I am. And I did all the things and God didn't take this away. So I guess this is the way I have to be, or maybe it's continuing on with porn addiction. Mm -hmm. But so many times what I observe is that people expect the results of discipleship without going through the process of yeah. discipleship. Mm -hmm. And so God did not intend us to deal with these issues alone. Mm -hmm. And so big guys will go decades trying to just white knuckle it and deal with it alone. And then they expect the results of discipleship, even though they haven't done confession and repentance and lived in community and apply mm -hmm. the gospel to their heart and uh, submitted themselves to wise counsel. And they, so they haven't done the process, but they expect the results. Yeah. And I see that all the time. It's like, if we want the results of discipleship, we have to engage with the process. That's, 100% true because funny enough so what I was talking about I connecting with these guys it's not just us meeting up over coffee and talking about hey here's the issues I've been having you know with the temptations or you know these women that I'm looking at or because these are all married guys too uh, but instead of talking about the things we're struggling with what we really dig down deep into is just that is a discipleship pathway between us really it's this pursuit of 
we're just going to go back to bare bones and we're going to dig deep with God and develop this relationship with him and really like focusing on meditating on scriptures. There's even like scripture memorization Mm -hmm. involved and like really try to enforce having multiple quiet times a week with God. It's these intentional, like it's this practical kind of curriculum kind of thing we try to do, but we're constantly texting or calling, encouraging each other throughout the week. Be like, bro, how did you have your quiet time today? How you doing? Uh, you know, Hey, how's your scripture memorization? It sounds, you know, almost like schoolwork kind of a thing, but really what it's doing, it's just making this relationship with Christ, this foundation in our faith, like almost at a subconscious level to where it's like, I could just spout these scriptures to where if a certain situation comes up, it's like, Oh, I could totally refute that. You know, as like, you know, Jesus did in the desert and wilderness, uh, sort of thing. And I found that, you know, it's for the longest time, it's been me just trying to figure out how to run away from this issue. But really, uh, what is it? Is it Paul or Peter that says submit to God and flee? Uh, Mm. The idea is that you need to surrender to God and let him do all the work is the issue. And so rather than running away from all these problems, I need to just fall at Jesus' feet and know that he's powerful enough to take care of it. Absolutely. Yeah. What has that looked like in your marriage now that mm-hmm. you've disclosed your your sexual addiction mm-hmm. and move forward in marriage? Um, how did that help your marriage? How did you guys rebuild trust? Yeah. Uh, what did you guys learn through that? Yeah. So it, yeah, obviously the first couple of weeks afterward it w- was a little rough. Uh, you know, we, I started with some accountability software trying that so that she could see what was going on. But then after a while, she didn't want to be involved in that part because that still would just weigh heavy on her. Mm-hmm. So it's usually best to have like a, another trusted friend uh, to keep you accountable, maybe another guy friend or uh, someone, a pastor or someone in leadership in church. Um, so I went that route. And the idea was just to be honest as much as possible. And um, yeah, it's the even today, what, what's funny is because we started this group, me and these other guys, just early last year, or no, late last year. And uh, I, I, every once in a while, I'll kind of talk about what we're talking about with my wife. And uh, I said, yeah, it turns out, you know, hey, multiple guys, do these guys also struggle with the same thing I do. And the thing is that their wives were taking it a lot harder than like Jamo was now. Jamo's got this fortitude. She's like, I understand. It's a thing that happens in our culture today. Guys struggle with it. And um, I think one thing that's helped her a bit, too, is we're actually both involved a lot, like in the local theater community, which Mm -hmm. is like totally opposite from like church. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, all those heathens. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so it's it's not that she's like numb to it, but I think she understands like almost just this primalness that's in the world around us that it's just it's it's impossible to avoid almost and then trying to be a good christian boy in the midst of it and trying to keep pure in a marriage and then when you have the baggage from your childhood and the the mm-hmm. paths you've gone down there yes. it's bringing a lot into the marriage that then when you're not being honest about mm-hmm. it snowballs inside your heart because that's yeah. what secrets do when we keep them a yep. secret so that's yeah and I think that was one of the pivotal moments because it wasn't just a one night I told like it was just the one night I told her, hey, I'm struggling with porn. And I was like, oh, that's a big red light for her because she's all of a sudden like now my husband's in comp- I'm in competition with this mm-hmm. stuff that she mm-hmm. can't compete at all when really it's totally two different ballparks. Absolutely. Really, uh, at least for guys. And it would it'd be this process of weeks down the road of me kind of explaining to her, hey, this is I think what it stems from. And even it came down to like one of one of the pivotal moments why I think it's such a very sensitive issue for me too, is it wasn't just me experimenting with other boys at a young age, but there actually was an instance of sexual trauma or sexual abuse. One person who I thought was my friend, even in the fourth grade, uh, manipulated me one night to do things that I did not want to do. I I was literally fearing for my life because he was threatening me with like sharp objects, like an arrow, uh, trying to like pin me against the wall. So, and uh, and I ran away from that um, soon after and cut off that friendship and like wanted to switch classes. So I never saw him again. And uh, and with that, like when I even explained that to my wife, like that was a moment where something clicked in her. Like it wasn't so much that she was in pain herself, but her heart actually broke for me. Mm. She had compassion. Yeah. She, she was like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And realizing that even out of 
what's so interesting, it's so backwards that out of trauma, especially in the area of sex, is that it almost promotes and cascades down to more negative sexual behaviors than a lot of people. And that's Absolutely. what happened at, in my case. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even in that, um, down the road, even when I went to college or just graduating college, my father, he, I, I, I turned out that he had a, an affair. Um, and out of it, I have a half sister. She's, she's a great person. And my, my mom and my dad, they've reconciled now. Uh, but I mean, during that time I was just angry. And so that all that rage and that emotion stemmed more into these negative behaviors. And I saw that the issue, I wasn't so much mad at my dad because of what he did, but I was so mad because I was afraid of who I might become that that would maybe be me that I don't want to betray my wife. I don't want to betray my son. Um, and I saw what it did to my family, but by the grace of God, my dad actually turned around in repentance and he not only sought church, uh, sought help in the church, but he went to an SA group, got therapy. Um, and my mom was so gracious along the way. And so with that, that was a, I mean, that was for me, uh, like almost to idolize in the sense of like, Hey, there is redemption here by mm-hmm. the grace of God. Um, so I've seen hope. I've so seen, you've the other seen you know, redemption in multiple generations in your family. Yeah. And, but you've seen how, you know, sexual sin, you know, sin permeates different generations and is passed from one generation to another. Mm-hmm. And so we need to be discipling our kids and breaking those cycles of dysfunction and oh, sin. Man. You know, one of the issues I, I've talked about a lot in the past, I'm sure in some different episodes is dealing with our sexual sin before we get married, because there's this culture within the church that if you just hold off, you know, for intercourse until your wedding night, then, you know, your wife will fulfill all of your dreams and your fantasies. It's like that. And that is so ridiculous because for one thing our so many times our dreams and our fantasies are coming from absolute dysfunction Mm -hmm. and things that our wife should never be expected to fulfill. Right. And so we're really using her and putting false expectations on her and a pressure on her to, you know, satisfy our sin Mm -hmm. nature. And, and that's something that she was never meant to do. Yeah. And so I, I see guys so many times, like you've got to deal with your sexual sin and your desires and Mm -hmm. your misplaced expectations and your dysfunction and your trauma before you get married, uh, and not put that on your spouse because if you're struggling before you get married you're going to struggle after you get married oh your marriage is not going to flip a switch and like oh i'm satisfied it's like if you're uh dealing with sin before marriage you're going to deal with sin after marriage and your your wife can never do enough to satisfy your Mm -hmm. sinful desire absolutely like your your intimacy with your wife should be coming out of a healthy gospel centered place of, Mm -hmm. of deep knowledge of one another and deep trust of one another and reliance and commitment. It's out of those uh, areas that then we have a healthy desire for intimacy. Yeah. And so when our desire for intimacy with our wife is coming from a place of sin and dysfunction, it's never going to be healthy and it's never going to fulfill us and it's never going to be life giving to her. Yeah. Totally. And so we, and not that we are ever completely, we can never be completely transformed before marriage, yeah. but we need to deal with it and we need to be on a road of redemption of, of seeing it clearly of seeing it for what it is and then having the right expectations for our wife. Absolutely. I, uh, I, um, I, I really lucked out and, uh, well, I thank God for, my wife because she's been as i said before super gracious super patient with it and i realized that yeah early on in our marriage that i was totally projecting those things that i would even wake her up in the middle of the night just to you know get what i want things like that and it was just is it yeah it was totally dysfunctional and it was all about me whereas now especially now that i see that she's a precious gift from god for me that she is a person and a child of god and not an object not just something for me to you know be a checkbox and uh, mark it off um that i i i've trying to be a lot more uh slow to approach and just communicate even more is is being honest with her uh in those situations and uh yeah i've i would say that i I'm, I'm there is still there's still work to be done in the process just in the realm of like sexual temptation absolutely there I, always like is. I said, there's, there, there always is but uh wherever that is, I think God's grace bounds even more. And so with that, I'm thankful for the brothers that I have, that I have to lean on even more thankful for my wife who's gracious to me. Um, and 
I just, I, if, if there's anything I want people to know out of all this, cause the funny thing is, I know one thing that we connected with on this is that I amidst all this, I wasn't, like I said before, I wasn't attracted to other men. I wasn't yeah. gay. I didn't think that I was. And, and there's some guys in that I, position where maybe they would have had those tendencies or temptation and that experimentation leads them in that direction yeah. and really cements it in. Mm-hmm. And you weren't one of those guys. Yeah. And so you didn't have that attraction towards towards boys or men. But uh, it was still sometimes we uh, just we want whatever is going to satisfy and whatever is yeah. the easiest. And. So what, what encouragement would he have to parents? Mm. You have a little guy now, yeah. so he's one <laughs> and super cute. Yeah. And so uh, as do you think about raising him and you know, we all want to avoid the mistakes of previous generations, not to blame our parents for our own sin, but I see so many parents who don't understand uh, what levels of experimentation and what happens at sleepovers and yeah. so many things are going to affect their kids deeply. And so yeah. now that you're a parent, how are you putting some of this into practice for your parenting to maybe shepherd your child's heart to protect them, mm-hmm. but also prepare them for the world. You can't raise them in a bubble, yeah. but we need to be shepherding and preparing them. Yeah, man, that, that is the biggest question ever. I think the heaviest one for me, I would say, um, yes, uh, before all the protection, the guidelines and the barriers go all in place, I think the very first thing that needs to happen is just this reassurance that their value comes from the fact that they're loved by God, that they're loved by mom and dad, and that it doesn't come from what they can do or how they look. It's not by stuff that's on the surface, but it's the fact that they are significantly and wonderfully made from God. Uh, That above all is, is key and that there is a God who... Uh, loves them, but also wants to grow with them in a beautiful relationship, just like it was meant to be from the start. And that to know that there's going to be a lot of noise, there's going to be a lot of lies that are going to be thrown your way. But to know that mom and dad, like this is a safe place. And we want you to know that not only are you loved, but you can be honest with us and that we're not going to throw out shame. We're not going to, you know, there's, there's bound to be disappointment. Yes, I get that. But that doesn't mean we don't love you any less. Um, and then with that, of course, as culture just continues to get more radical with whatever things shift in the waves, you know, there, there will be some barriers, I think, obviously, like you said, with the different sleepovers and things like that. But before that, you know, there needs to be just this explanation of why and understanding and just making it to where even some of these talks aren't just so rare and far in between that's not so taboo like it's and that's the things like even that i'm seeing in the church today these talks like it needs to happen so much more i i have Mm -hmm. parents ask you know when should i have the talk with my son it's like you don't have a talk you have thousands (laughs) of talks yeah and teaching your children about relationships and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and marriage and how men and women interact that that's something that should be going on, you know, throughout their childhood yeah. and it should be ongoing conversation and ongoing discipleship and not just a talk. Oh, but so absolutely. many times when uh, parents have the talk with their kids, it's too late yeah. and their, their child oh has gosh. already been experimenting and found pornography and is steep in sexual addiction. Mm-hmm. And there needs to be a constant shepherding of their heart throughout their childhood at age appropriate levels, but usually much sooner than most parents think. Yeah. You know, uh, as much as I like to say, like, this is how I, I would, I want it to be, at least in my situation with my child. Um, <laughs> I am definitely like, I don't know if you're all about the Enneagram thing. I'm oh, a nine yeah. person. Yeah. I'm a peacemaker. So conflict oh, is not my thing. I'm married thing. to a peacemaker. There you go. So, yes. so but my wife two, is totally opposite. I have a lot of listeners who freaked out over my episode on the Enneagram a few weeks ago or months ago because <laughs> they thought it was, it's satanic. Oh and no. I still disagree uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, because I look at the facts, but sorry, I just made everyone angry again. You're fine. But yes, sorry. I'm a two and I'm married to a nine. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. So but my wife, she's very much the, you know, go getter brash person. She almost like embraces conflict. It's so weird and throws me (laughs) off. But somewhere in between, Mm. I feel like we're the perfect pair to kind of tag team up and to establish this. uh, Like I said, this safe space of value and love that's rooted in God. Um, And so I don't have any doubt in that. So I'll I'll probably Mm. need some prayer as far as fortitude on my side, being able to like be able to just come out and say these things. Yes, but, uh, absolutely. Uh, 
God is good. And I know uh, he'll make it work. Absolutely. Awesome. <clears throat> Shannon, I'm so encouraged by your story and I'm so encouraged by just uh, your faith and your marriage and your now parenting. And it's such a blessing that after 10 years we can reconnect yeah. and I can see what that God's been at work in your life. Uh, do you have any parting words of wisdom on for the person who's struggling with some type of sexual addiction? Uh, mm. What is the one truth you want them to know right now? Yeah, man. Um, well, just as I have found so much in just like listening to this podcast, because listening to your podcast, your story and your ministry has really reignited this in me too, to want to first of all, reach out to you. But um, if anything, the first thing I got to say is you're not alone. Um, this is, if anything, it's probably one of the most like rampant struggles out there uh, amongst men, uh, Christian men <laughs> at that, Absolutely. You know, especially Christian men, uh, because we have to fight it so hard and it goes against our very nature. Um, and so my next uh, word of wisdom at that would be like, find a brother, find a friend, someone close do not go at it alone, please. You will not get out of it on yourself uh, unless you have a, you know, some miraculous experience on the road to Damascus with God <laughs> sort of thing. But it's, uh, it's you need brothers in this struggle. Um, and to know that it's not necessarily about just like cutting it off and quitting it, but it's, it's this journey of repentance, this journey of redemption and sanctification and knowing that Christ is, is doing a work in you and just because you mess up once doesn't mean that it's you're done uh when you fall down you know that there's even this in our study this whole idea of this graph of this these peaks of rising and falling whereas we hit a good stride and we fall but really how this graph should progress is there's valleys and peaks but as you go up your next valley is actually not lower than your previous one it keeps it's, it's this walk that we yeah. constantly have. And it's okay to mess up. Um, what really matters is how you respond to that failure. Are you going to get up? Are you going to reach out to somebody? Are you going to ask God for forgiveness and move on? Absolutely. That's a great mm -hmm. word to end it on. So thank you so much for sharing your heart with us, Shannon, and thanks, your story. And um, maybe we'll we'll see you again another time. Yeah. So. Thanks, Brady. Appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Yep. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Calibrate Conversations. Hope that you can join us next week and that you can embrace God's standard for your sexuality. Make sure to check out calibrateministries.com for more resources and to see how you can support the ministry. Thank you. Thank you.